Section 22 marks an important milestone in our ocean module because it signifies that we actually have three sections left to go to complete Module 6. As you can see, the title of this section is Advantages of Negotiating Contracts with an NVOCC. In the previous section, we showed an example of a service contract between a BCO and a steamship line. Now we're going to talk about advantages of working with NVOCCs, those non-vessel operating common carriers, which of course is a little bit different than a BCO negotiating directly with a steamship line. We want to point out those differences. First bullet, many U.S. importers choose to negotiate contracts with NVOCCs. It is indeed a strategic decision. And when BCOs negotiate and work with NVOCCs, the resulting contract, as we noted from our definitions several sections ago, it's referred to as an NVOCC service arrangement. Here's one big advantage in our second bullet we pointed out. NVOCCs normally have contracts with multiple steamship lines. It is not unusual at all to see a large NVOCC have global contracts with a dozen, even more, steamship lines. That means that the BCO can have the benefit of the non-vessel operating common carrier's relationships and operational breadth and scope as a direct result of an NVOCC service arrangement. And our third bullet, carrying on with that theme, importers negotiate with one company when working with an NVOCC as opposed to multiple steamship lines. There is no written law or rule that says a BCO has to work exclusively with steamship lines or exclusively with NVOCCs. They can mix and match. We've already talked about that, actually. But when an importer works directly with steamship lines, there's an individual contract with each one. When working with an NVOCC, there is one contract. We make that point in our final bullet on this slide. As we've mentioned briefly already, NVOCCs, it should be clear that they offer considerable service flexibility. Depending on the number of contracts an NVO has with steamship lines, that's how many companies an NVO can work with on behalf of a U.S. importer. There's lots of flexibility, more steamship lines to work with. As such, there will be multiple sailing schedules from the same port pairs, actually. When we look at the busier ports in Asia, there might be a half a dozen steamship lines that offer the same port pairs that the BCO, working in conjunction with the non-vessel operating common carrier, can choose from. More options, I guess, is what we're trying to say here. And of course, if there's more steamship lines, by definition, there should be more availability of equipment, too. An accounting point to make in our last bullet, invoicing is streamlined. For every contract, for every bill of lading, there's going to be an invoice. Working with an NVOCC, freight invoices come from a single company, that NVO. In terms of additional services, and we went through all of these in detail, so we're not going to define each one. Hopefully, we shouldn't have to do that given the time we dedicated to these subjects. But we do want to point out that NVOCCs, just like a steamship line, in addition to offering port-to-port -port transportation, they offer a bunch of other support services, too, like... Purchase order management, we spoke of ad nauseum. Coordination with vendors. Because NVOCCs can operate as freight forwarders too, they're almost synonymous terms actually, but because an NVO when properly licensed is essentially an ocean freight forwarder, they can coordinate with the vendors overseas. Contact them, help them with bookings, explain details, offer advice, those types of things. As we just said, NVOs in their capacity as freight folders, they can handle container bookings, hopefully electronically. They can organize container spotting, arranging for three 40-foot containers to be spotted at a vendor's factory outside of Mumbai in India on a Tuesday, for example. They can do origin drayage, CFS management, all of the stuff that we've already talked about. Other things that NVOCCs can do, value-added services, like... Cargo labeling in a CFS, barcoding, retail-ready services. And these are things, by the way, that we'll talk in even greater detail about in Module 7. Take a mental note of that. We'll continue on from here.
But of course, NVOCCs, in their capacity as an ocean freight forwarder at origin, they can issue the forwarder's cargo receipt. Within a CFS, they can stuff containers, prepare ocean documentation, the ocean bills of lading, and naturally, when properly licensed at origin, NVOs, freight forwarders, can provide origin customs clearance. What else? The entire portfolio, basically, of ocean freight forwarding services. Generation of an advance ship notice. Surely you recall our talk about that document. Inbound milestone tracking online, where the GPS tracking of vessels and containers on board vessels is relatively easy today. NVOCCs, if they are a properly licensed customs broker in the U.S., they can provide U.S. customs clearance. Transload capabilities, which again we'll talk about in detail in Module 7. And any domestic on-forwarding, getting containers and merchandise from the first port of arrival, first port of discharge, and getting goods into the interior of the country. What we've seen here in the last couple slides is really a listing, a summary of the service portfolio of NVOCC slash ocean freight forwarders, all of whom are known as ocean transportation intermediaries, as we know from our previous definitions. Quick trade tip. The logistics divisions of ocean carriers offer the same exact suite of services as NVOCCs. It's important to point this out because we don't want to create an imbalance towards favoring NVOCCs. That's not the point of the exercise here. The point of the exercise is to point out what some of the advantages are. With that said, most every steamship line, not all, but many, have their own logistics divisions that are essentially NVOCCs. They do the exact same thing. Let's wrap up this section with a real-world scenario entitled Ocean Carrier versus NVOCC Contracts because we indeed do want to be fair in our treatment of both sides of the ocean transportation coin. The logistics team from a medium-sized importer of bicycles and cycling accessories is in the process of negotiating its contracts with ocean carriers and NVOCCs. During an internal meeting, the director of logistics asks one of her direct reports about the pros and cons of working directly with ocean carriers versus non-vessel operating common carriers. How might she, this direct report, answer the question? Second paragraph. While it is important to point out that it is not the purpose of this exercise to favor one option over the other, there are some differences between the two that can be pointed out. As such, the answer might begin with recognition that depending on the volume of TEUs in play, how many containers this bicycle importer is going to negotiate for, the bike importer can negotiate better pricing directly with the ocean carrier. Why is that? Because the importer is going direct to the source. There's no middle person. An NVOCC can be considered a middle person, really. Also, if the ocean carrier has a logistics arm, and we just talked about this a moment ago, it will likely offer all of the additional services that NVOs offer in the marketplace. That is indeed true. That's part of our level setting conversation. On the other hand, and depending on the size of the NVOCC that the bike importer is negotiating with, said bicycle importer can negotiate very competitive rates with an NVOCC. What does that mean? Well, really large NVOCCs, they manage hundreds of thousands or even millions of containers contractually with the steamship lines. They get really cheap rates, do the NVOCCs. They can turn around and resell those rates in the marketplace, sometimes at a price lower than an individual BCO could do on their own. It's a volume thing, but it is indeed true. Not always true, but oftentimes true. Second sentence, last paragraph. Additionally, NVOs normally have contracts in place with several steamship lines, so they have the flexibility to provide multiple sailing options for a variety of port pairs. We talked about that in detail. Finally, and as noted previously, NVOCCs feature a number of value-added logistics services that complement ocean transportation. In the end, the decision to work with an ocean carrier directly versus an NVOCC is a strategic one. Both have pros and cons, both have advantages and disadvantages. Our job has been to provide an objective portrayal of what those pros, cons, advantages, and disadvantages are. 
we will wrap up this section now. And upon our return, we're going to get into best practices for U.S. importers working with freight forwarders and NVOCCs.